All right. So you had so what was the question? Up. Oh, Chris is very frozen right now. I had mentioned how um, just to, you know, we were just talking off camera about the hunting and searching. I had mentioned that I popped about 30 seeds uh, this morning. Are you back, Chris? Mm-hmm. Yep. And you're curious which ones, right? Yeah, yeah. What are you hunting, man? Uh, so I already looked through a couple of the uh, Wilson Zero Honey Banana. I was very, very impressed from such a small population what was coming out. So I was highly motivated to search through again, even if it was another limited small population, just because such marvelous things coming out. Um, I did about 12 uh, Cuban Black Haze crossed with the Animal Mints, which uh, I think they kind of don't go together, which is why I like them. A lot of people who are like pro Haze are anti cookies. So I kind of like that those are mingled together because I love just about everything. And awesome. uh the last one is uh, Dude Pifco's interpretation on Sour Diesel. And I know it's a long shot, but I'm going through. I think I got 12 or 13 of those just to see if anything interesting comes out. Awesome. Um, a lot of people are trying to find that original Sour Diesel and, and hunt through to find, you know, the one that was uh, similar to those uh, late 90s, early 2000s sours that really got people yeah. excited. So, yeah. He has it for sure. I smoked his flower. He was gracious enough to gift me an eighth of his sour. And me and my cousin, who both kind of grew up with it, we did all the tests we could, and it checked all the boxes. We we dyed it out four times and relit it. And by and by the last time, it was this big. It's still that first puff would just drop your shoulders. The mm -hmm. first hit that I had, I couldn't even exhale it when I was already screaming. There was like smoke, you know. I was, you know, spitting as I was yelling. And it was that much excitement from the first inhale. It was all there. Like I was really just screaming. So Very I think cool. it's still super recessive. I think he hunted through a whole big population to find it or probably got re-gifted it. But I think it's worth a swing anyways. Cool. So uh, just quickly to give everyone some context, uh, Chris and I have been going back and forth for a couple of months trying to lock down a date to do this. It's a presentation he had given in person my radar and i was like let's do it again uh it is torrential downpours in california right now so uh it actually the sun the clouds parted down here in la but where chris is up in uh where are you in norcal san in francisco area okay san francisco. all right yep. so it is still pouring right there right yep yeah i think we yeah. might have a well, little actually, bit of a low you, you but look be, you look better down. than you've looked the entire time so he was all glitchy hey. before but uh, uh yeah. anyway if it's glitchy it's because of the rain all right cool so with that uh i'm gonna listen but i'm gonna jump off and you're in good hands with the good lobster cool uh well i'll just i'll just start off with the presentation and then you know uh travis jump in if you, you want to um it, you know uh anywhere you see appropriate uh to help guide this but um yeah, so I did present this at Grow Generation um, in the LA, and thank you for to them. Um, you know, the first thing I want to do uh, is is say thank you to uh, you know Future Cannabis Project for having me today. Um, everyone in attendance and everyone who uh, watches this, uh, as well as Node Labs and Compounds Genetics for just giving me the opportunity to learn so much in this field. Um, and then, of course, thank uh, all the all the growers and all the OG growers, everyone who's uh, taught me a tip or a trick. Um, and um, and we're really uh, all the growers today are standing in the shoulders of giants of people who um, really like pioneered how to grow this plant. And so I'm very excited to be part of, um, you know, the future of this of this plant. And uh, pheno hunting is a huge part of that. So um, let's get into it. Um, uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I went to the uh, University of Vermont, uh, studying ev evolutionary biology. Um, I was a botanist for the for uh, state of California. Um, and kind of a self-trained tissue culture scientist. Um, I love plants, huge uh, plant nerd. Um, I currently work as the uh, main breeder and selector for compound genetics and the CSO of Node Labs. Um, uh, Chris Lynch and I worked together for the past three years and we're, uh, he taught me so much about this process. Um, and we've been working together to do uh, make compound genetic strains since then. Um, hunted a bunch of seed lines. And so um, I just think just this year, we've hunted like uh, a th over a thousand seeds in in house, and um, about three or three to five thousand total with partners and other 
other people. Um, we've stabilized uh, hundreds of clones into our tissue culture lab. And that's really what we do at Node Labs is we hunt gear with breeders and then we initiate it into the tissue culture laboratory and then have it available for commercial growers. Um, and then you can see some of these more uh, uh, influential um, clones throughout the years that have I've been a part of either uh, breeding and being right part of the, you know, chucking the pollen or stabilizing the clone of and getting the tissue culture. So, yeah. Um, Travis, you have any questions so far or? Yeah. I, I like, this is Peter. I like, uh, you don't have the pen in your uh, front pocket. You have the scissors. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think Arroyo got that picture during a like a highlight they have coming out and uh, I was literally like in the midst of some sort of like actual work and they're like take a picture and I was like okay <laughs> that was not staged shockingly <laughs> okay um no real so we'll into... no real questions yet but as far as who you are um, I spent a bunch of my life in St Johnsbury and in SF so uh, as far as the who am I I'm digging it <laughs> awesome um, oh very cool yeah Vermont man I love love Vermont. Um, but uh, cool. So what is pheno hunting and why do we do it? Um, you know, uh, seeds, when, when you pop seeds, every single one is different. Um, and it's like, it's like brothers and sisters in your family. Like you have the same parents, but you look different and, you know, you're related, but you're not the same person. Um, clones, obviously, are genetically identical. And so they behave a lot more, a uh, lot more similarly. And really, you know, the... Uh, the industry, the commercial growing of cannabis relies a lot on clones because, you, the, you know, the expression is uniform. Um, so pheno hunting is kind of a combined effort of growing the seeds, observing the phenotypes, and then simultaneously retaining a clone from those, from those original seedlings, and then uh, matching whatever is the best, you know, seed phenotype in the flowering room to the clone, and then, you know, and then working on that line uh, to, to make a stabilized clone. Um, so again, pheno hunting, seed germination, phenotyping, and clone stabilization. These are kind of like uh, agriculture words, like phenotyping, and then clone stabilization is kind of like ag words you'd see in a uh, university or something. Um, so here's a cool like example of this. Um, here's um, when we a pheno hunted mellows, which is a spritzer by grape gasoline awesome awesome line you can see that there's a lot of different expressions in between these so just as a little highlight we could see the mellows eight on the left um has like kind of a small bud um it is is very purple it has kind of a small bud uh, morphology and is more compact the mellow seven also has that purple but it has huge big buds that kind of build on each other less compact and then the mellows 14 also has that compact but has a little bit of a different color to it you can see it's like magenta instead of a uh, kind of like dark purple or gray it's more magenta so these sister can be wildly different um and just for the people at home just to illustrate that uh these are three clone selections we made from a pheno hunt um so i talked a little bit about this before you know pheno hunting like clones are king because of the uh, uh quality and character being um so important when you're selling a batch of, of cannabis, you want it to all perform the same. So you want a jar here and a jar there. It should be the same experience and you have to have clones for that really. Um, another one that's kind of a sleeper for non-growers is canopy management. Um, a couple traits that can be wildly different among sisters is like stretch or veg speed. And you know, uh, indoor growers especially know that if you just have a slight difference in, in canopy height, it's going to dramatically affect the value of the or, or like the uh, quality of the of the buds, and you get those really great yields when you have a really dialed-in system, as well as having clones that all behave exactly the same. Um, variability of expression, obviously, uh, you know, you want it to taste the same and affect you in the same way. So, if we're really looking for even recreational or medicinal value, you want it to be you know impact you in a consistent way. Um, and then novelty, this is kind of another like sleeper, like counterintuitive thing, right? Um, it's actually easier to make clone lines that are a lot different than seed lines that are a lot different. The variability amongst plants in a seed line is going to be a lot different. But if you really want to like give the market something new and put it in a jar as a brand, it's easier to make a new clone 
to do to do that than to make a new seed line that performs at those at those rigors. And we can talk about why, but um, yeah, this is just how it works. Clones are king. How do you feel about running a clone for your initial round? Me personally, ah, I like to take question. two cuttings off of the seedling. I keep one uh, one cutting as the backup and then flower one cutting immediately and then usually throw away or give away the seedling as long as I have a solid backup. Any thoughts on that? That's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's a great practice. Um, it definitely, it, it makes the timeline a little longer than typical because if you're talking about a rooted and strong seedling that you're taking clones off of, you can get that plant flipped faster than its corresponding clone. And right, like, so you're kind of subtracting two weeks off the process. So if you're trying to do like high throughput, it's going to be a little different, but the clone, the clone behaves a little differently than the seedling. So there's you two better there, data. You get much better data. Exactly. You, you know how it will behave in the future a lot better. And then you avoid a couple traits that are uh, kind of uh, endemic to seedlings. Two traits. Number one, the nodes are parallel. Um, so the, the nodes typically originate from the same location in a parallel fashion instead of alternating. And two, you don't get the same. Uh, there, there is a phytohormone called gibberellins that uh, are more present in seedlings than in clones. And that like makes more apical dominance like a bigger top bud than, than typical. So uh, that's a great call, um, and I would recommend doing that. Although um, for the home hobbyist, that might that might be a little bit difficult. Um, and you're also screening through um, success of that clone taking. So if you might not end up running phenotypes that didn't clone well because of time. So that's kind of an interesting wrinkle. Um, did that answer your question, Travis? Absolutely. I appreciate it. I love the point on how there's symmetric growth when they're seedlings. I feel like that can be very deceiving and just yes. give mixed data on how it's going to perform for the rest of eternity if you're going to keep it. Absolutely. Yep. You don't really get bud structure or like you don't get like the proper structure yet. So, um, okay. So what I wanted to talk about today is, uh, yeah, the underlying process and principles of pheno hunting, um, seed germination, keeping clone backups selection process and then and then if we have time we can talk about some advanced techniques in pheno hunting um you know this this uh this process really intrigues me because uh there's so many different ways to do it and depending on your setup and how much uh bandwidth you have and time and and lights and everything you you might employ a bunch of different strategies and i i think that's just fascinating so we're going to talk a lot about that today um so the first part of this that i really like I'm, and you know, my team would probably say I'm a, I'm a little over overzealous about. It, you could say is choosing a target. You shouldn't just like get seeds, or if you're trying to make seeds, if you're breeding seeds and then and trying to select a clone in that, you should have like a plan, because different. Um, you, you're going to employ a different strategy depending on what plan you're put down to put in there, and everyone has a limit on how much money they can spend and time they can spend to um, to work through this uh you know the pheno hunting process and so you should really like dedicate your time and efforts on the stage that are going to make the most impact um so you know what do we mean by a target like you know you cr you cross uh two things like like let's talk about that um what what is it called again honey uh what were the crosses you're hunting the uh yeah, wilson the zero honey, by the honey banana wilson zero i feel like the um the cuban black haze and the animal mints are a good example because they're so polarized mm -hmm. where to me it would have a nice cookie inhale and a nice hazy exhale mm -hmm. so that's just from you know an un, uneducated approach but like that's what i'll kind of be looking for i want not so much of a balanced flavor in the inhale and exhale i want like a little bit of diversity and with a nice calming effect but still like functional like from the cuban black you know okay so it sounds like most of the criteria you're going for are based on uh the experience of the smoke, right? Which means that you're going to keep, you should keep all or most of these phenotypes regardless how they grow and get them all dried, all cured, all trimmed up, maybe even all COA'd and all smoke test. And you should really focus on the sensory and uh, smoke test portion of that to like successfully and like do, do the best job you can to hunt that line, right? Which means that you shouldn't, you shouldn't put, dedicate that much effort into screening, um, 
for veg speed or uh, plant morphology or yield or like sensitivity to light or susceptibility to bud rot stuff like that right so that's sort of that's sort of an example a great example of like choosing the target um and then we can create a strategy based on that target um and again this is coming from someone who like has to juggle a lot of resources in pheno hunting so it's kind of like we can never do it all we can never have everyone chat you know like screen every single plant for every single trait at every single stage um and what we want to do is dedicate our resources and, and focus whoops oh, okay just went way to the end <laughs> give me a second sorry folks okay i don't know what happened there that's one thing I actually wanted to touch on when you get uh, when I'm sure you'll get to it is like, what's the fine line? You know, it's like, yes, you can go through a hundred thousand seeds, mm -hmm. but you're not going to be able to even meet 10% of them maybe. So what's the Great point where you could go through a 10 pack, but you're not going to have enough first, first dates to mingle enough. So I'd love to know where you think like those kind of like risk to reward lines are that that's intriguing. absolutely. Uh, well, I'll have a whole slide on that. And that's a great question. Awesome. Um, so so first we'll talk about analysis of grow conditions. So like, yeah, okay, let's start about it. If we're trying to hunt something, how, how many how many flowering slots do we have? What is our grow style? Um, how much bandwidth do we have? Um, is our team like, you know, is our, if we're, are we doing the loan as a hobbyist and we can check this every day or do we want something more low maintenance? All these things like factor in. So we're gonna pl blow through that. Um, analyzing the parents. Knowing a little bit about the parents gives you a huge leg up in the pheno hunting uh, process. You can't really get like a strong target if you haven't grown the parents or don't know anything about the parents. And I really think at this point in seed buyers and if, you, if you're getting seeds, it's really incumbent on the breeder to be able to tell you nearly everything about the parents to really tell you like what this is going to be. Um, and so... Uh, you know, asking ourselves these questions of, of saying, uh, of, you know, what are the dominant terpenes? How does it grow? Is it a fast veg, slow veg? Is it susceptible to this? Is it, uh, does it herm? Things like that, right? And so a couple of the things we really want to avoid when analyzing the parents is, uh, and this is written down here, avoid these. Lack of aroma, like don't grow stuff that doesn't have good terp. Oh, but I'll cross something with good terps that that is like one of those uh traits that if you can't get rid of it 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 messes up like there's no point in keeping that oh it's like so look how beautiful it is though it doesn't smell good it doesn't have that experience like ditch it obviously high per, per high herm propensity um intersex traits no good low thc testing can be shockingly difficult to like breed out excessive fox tailing and then the long flowering times are all things that like don't don't dig too much into those lines. Uh, they're too difficult to get out. Um, I'm not going to touch on this too much, but you can see we kind of, we did that nice, uh, you know, Travis, your, your example is a nice example of this, but like you're, what you're talking about right there is a great uh, example of like, okay, let's, let's uh, focus on those final, uh, let's focus on those final stages of sensory and COA testing, right? However, if you're trying to get a high yielder, we, we're going to really focus our efforts on like analyzing the bud structure and the plants in that actual flowering stage, like while they're in the nursery and stuff. Right. Um, so that's, that's just an illustration of strategy and, uh, and being a very important part of uh, juggling resources. Okay. This is what you touched on earlier, uh, Travis. And I want to like make this type of lexicon, like uh, these type of words and how we use them kind of um, typical in cannabis, but um an average phenotype versus an anomalous phenotype. Okay, what do I mean by that? You know, if you have uh, you have mom and dad, and then they have a, a child, they're you know likely they're just going to look a little bit like mom, a little bit like dad. Cool, right? If you want something that's really oddball or unique, you probably need to hunt through a lot more seeds, right? So we without getting into the like genetics, um, actually how this works genetically, which we can't get into at the end here. If you just want the average phenotype, like, oh, I wonder what Honey Banana and Wilson Zero look like. Well, I like traits from Honey Banana and I like traits from Wilson Zero. You don't need that many seeds. Like you can have really successful hunts and some of the best strains in the world are from like 10 seeds, like bag seeds, three seeds, five seeds, 10 seeds. I mean, I would recommend 
10 to 50 seeds for an average hunt. And our average hunt is like 25 seeds from a seed line. But I would rather hunt more different seed lines than more seeds from the same line. Does that make sense? Um, Absolutely. I, um, I've noticed that just from experience as well. I just went through a population of about 50 and there was only one that was clear cut. Like it was very, very close to the mother, you know, it had all of the good and bad things associated with it. And, uh, there was only one like that. Like you said, you know, a, a 10 pack, you'd only have a 20% chance if that's what you were looking for. So I right. think that's the sweet spot as well, you know, just from experience. And like compound genetics, seed packs, like we sell 13 seeds per pack. We are fully confident that if you buy one pack, you'll get a keeper clone that you really like that you can grow. Um, that's when we do our testing and stuff. That's the whole point. Right. So when I, if I say, oh, you really need a hundred seeds and that, that kind of is like, well, then why are you selling 13 seed packs? It's like, I no, feel like if you're looking for the anomalous one, like you said, like out of the 50, I think I probably got 20 females to the end of flower that made it that far. And 10 of them are interesting enough to run again. Sure. So it's almost like a whole fresh hunt, you know, <laughs> the so secondary I feel like the average one to get in there, you would find one you'd most likely be happy with. It might be a little fruitier or a little hazier or this, that, or the other, but there was winners left and right. But that one was the only one. It was just like a picture of like, you know, it's one, it's just, it was just there. Definitely. So, yeah, so that's, a, that's like typically what people are doing in hobbyists and everything is average phenotype. Um, anomalous phenotype, you're usually looking for recessive traits. So a really good example, of this would be like the, like breeding autoflowers. You can't do like a 10 seed pheno hunt to breed autoflowers. It's a recessive trait. You really need a greenhouse with, with a hunt, you know, hundred, 500,000 seeds to be able to find combination of a recessive trait and a bunch of good and a bunch of positive traits coupled with that. So it really depends on your strategy and what you're specifically looking for. F2s are much better for anomalous phenohype than an F1 generation. F1 being the first hybrid between two, you know, distinct parents. Um, uh, if, if I have, if there's any like confusion on some of that lexicon, you know, peel back the layers. I'm happy to explain the that's, that's, that's yield specifically you're referencing with that, right? And maybe not necessarily a, fr a flavor profile or, or a cannabinoid that's specifically yield it says on there. Um, that's for, just anomalous in general. Okay. I see. That's just a subset of anomalous. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so one thing I want to, uh, um, want to wave a big, big flag, uh, to anyone here is that like misconception, you need a lot of seeds to find a good phenotype when people might be like 10,000 seed phenotype hunt. And I'm like, good luck screening through those. Like, I don't know how you're gonna do that. Um, and you can have a great, like people can find great clones off just one seed pack. It's to happen many, many times. So go hunt seeds like you'll find something great um okay pheno hunting timeline. we're getting technical here um pheno hunting timeline you have three different tracks here so this is kind of cut off sorry this is the flowering of the seedlings right um three different tracks you have the flowering which is the plants that you're putting the flower to do the phenotyping and then you have the backup clones from those flowering plants that you're comparing and then you have some of this selection like phases and, and criteria. So I'm going to push through this a little bit fast because I don't want to get hung up and there's a lot to go through here. But, um, you know, you're going to germinate the seeds, transplant and veg. At this point, we're going to take and Travis, you mentioned that earlier, taking clones off those. If you were to take if you were to flower the clone, then this would kind of split and extend a bit until those clones are ready to flower. Um, but uh, yeah, at that point, about three weeks in, you're going to be scouting for herms. Many, many seed lines have herms. It's like uh, built into the genetics of the cannabis plant. So if you are pheno hunting, you should always be scouting for herms um, between weeks three and five primarily. Um, by the time you're getting to week uh, eight, nine of, of flowering, you now your backup clones are potentially kind of big plants and managing those is quite difficult. Um, you're going to do your harvest assessment and then you're going to do your assessment on sensory and COA. This phase, the harvest assessment is oftentimes like overlooked, like, you, oh crap, we need to harvest. And then you only look at the flower, you might end up like missing a lot of important traits to log there. Um, so that's the general pheno hunting timeline. Ooh, a graph. Um, 
during this selection timeline, like you said uh, earlier as well, should we should be narrowing things down as we go. Like we talked about, depending, like holding the clones, if you have 100 different seeds and you're flowering 100 plants, holding 100 clones for the entire duration of that is quite difficult. It's hard to keep them all healthy. It's hard to keep them all labeled properly. Um, you know, data tracking and all that crap is kind of like not that e like it's it seems easy but when you do this in volume it's uh it's it's shockingly difficult and a lot of mistakes end up getting made when you do this uh, again and again so through this we should be looking at trying to reduce our selections all the way and notice that we're already reducing this before we even start flowering right don't move into your flowering room or your flowering tent plants that are blatantly seedlings that aren't healthy Plants that are blatantly not strong or they're six, inch, six inches tall when the other ones are 18 inches, like you're already killing those. So you should always overstock if you're trying to flower 10 plants, you should germinate 15 or 20 seeds. Like that's just good pheno hunting practice. Um, you're going to reduce some when you're uh, like on that harvest day because you don't like the way that some of them look uh, and they didn't perform that well uh, and they have some certain traits you want to avoid. You can kill some if you get a COA and you get some other quantitative data. And then finally, when you're smoking on it and you say, this is the one, that's when you determine your, your winner out of that hunt. Okay. Uh, this is like one of my favorite slides in this because a lot of this pheno hunting, it's focused on that sensory experience. It's, fo it's focused on, you know, looking at different weed and, and deciding, oh, I really like this clone. But these are kind of the skills we're involved that don't aren't that related to that that are critical. So number one, data tracking. Gosh, a lot of this is spreadsheet management. Guys, are pretty boring. But having accurate notes that trends that have the same numbers and the same, you know, they look familiar to you at the beginning, and then you know four months later, you still know what you're talking about and the numbers add up. It's pretty damn important. Um, following your plan, like you you have that target. Um, you can obviously, you know, you shouldn't throw away a clone you really like because you have a certain plan and you're, you know, putting in a box. But having a plan is important. Um, and then I also say be brutal. Like, oh, but it smells so nice. But it, but it, it's an impossible plant to trim. Or it has a test set 15, you know, 12%. It's like there's certain things that are kind of like, dude, it's not a winner. Like, let's grow winners. Be brutal. Kill the plants that don't check the boxes. And then lastly, loving your backup clones, keeping those backup clones for four months while they're just sitting there, uh, you know, focusing on those is really important. That's the biggest mistake people make is, uh, is letting those kind of like letting those, the, the health decline in those. And I'll tell you right now, it's like Murphy's law that you find the one you go back to the nursery and that's the only plant that's dead. And you're like, no, <laughs> it happens so more often than you think. I feel like a way that costs a little bit of work, but as long as you do the chore, to me, it helps ensure the health of the next generation. So let's say you kept the seedling or you have your backup cutting. Once it starts outgrowing its container or becoming a nuisance with its health or its, uh, or its space limitations, you kind of just take another cutting, which is another process, yep. but you just throw that into a one or a three gallon with some fresh soil or something with nutrition. Yep. And by the time you have enough data, you'll have a happy plant to rip more cuts off of. And you can even just gift away the other one or, you know, just kill it. And that strategy's worked for me before because I totally agree keeping those backups is important and tedious and loses attention sometimes. So I feel like just ripping a new cut, letting it root up and just throwing it in enough root room where you just give it water. You don't even have to trip on it. And it's like, it's good. Totally. And, and you know what? If that can be a condensed number, because things aren't looking that great and you're halfway through this pro or you're three quarters of the way through this process and you're, and you're at 25 promising phenotypes, giving your love and attention to 25 winners is a lot better than trying to keep a hundred sort of happy and then having some die. And I guarantee the one that die will be the one that you love. So I a hundred percent agree. Recloning it, um, you know, uh, keeping those, but, uh, how you keep the clone mothers is very dependent on your setup. Um, if you're a tent grower, if you're a commercial grower, it's going to be completely different. Yeah. Okay. Oh, bought me. Um, okay. So seed germination. Um, there are two, uh, different, there, there are two different types of germinations that happen in the, uh, uh, 
in the seed world in in the you know plant kingdom epigeal germinations and hypogeal germinations the difference is that the seed coat um like carry it gets carried up with the uh, extending uh uh, hypocotyl and and new foliage and cotyledon and like gets elongated out of the substrate and then hypogeal the seed coat stays in the substrate and then the shoot goes up um cannabis is an epigeal and because it has epigeal epigeal seeds have specific problems that you can that you want to avoid Oops. so um Seed germination, I'm not going to get too much into the the really, I actually have another protocol on this you can download off our website, but um, there's a couple, there's a bunch of different uh, techniques for this. I like to do some pre-rinse of the seeds, um, and I want to shout out to Alan of Root Down Genetics for helping me develop this protocol, the pre-rinse, um, with, uh, with uh, hypochlor, uh, excuse me, um, H2O2 being um, the primary agent for that rinsing. But um, a lot of people put uh, seeds in paper towels to germinate. When you're doing that, it's really easy to like check on each individual seed, but it's a little more annoying to transplant. This is good technique if you have like if you have like a seed pack or like a couple seed packs. If you want it, if you're running a lot of seeds, like you're not going to do this technique. So um, anyway, there's a bunch of different ways to do seed germ seed germination. I'm going to kind of plow through this, and uh, there's much more we can talk about this. Um, Pre-rinsing, again, you can uh, download the protocol on the website, and we'll put a link to that later, put that in the chat. Um, okay, most common problems with germinating seeds, uh, damping off, etiolation, and germinating upside down. So damping off is is kind of a catch-all name for a uh, d like rotting out disease that happens for seedlings and small plants. And it's typically that like elong uh, elongated place where it interfaces between the soil and the uh, uh and the uh you know the substrate and the beginning of the uh the crown this is like crown formation so having clean seeds really really helps this and not over watering really really helps this too um etiolation is the other one etiolation is a fancy word for that like excessive elongation the plant has when the light intensity uh oh, that's kind of cut off um excessive elongation of the plant when the light intensity isn't high you kind of want to run your seedlings once they have a couple true leaves with like a high, pretty high light, pretty common problem to run them under like baby them under low light. And then they get like super stringy and they become impossible to manage. Um, there is a trick that you can put like twist ties or you can use collar tags to uh, kind of support them. I can show you how to do that, but uh, there's some tricks to that, but really common. And then germinating upside down is one that often happens in um, like rock wool or, uh, or root riot, like plugs where the actual, you know, that hypogeal remember, sorry, epigeal uh, germination, that elongation of the cotyledon kind of goes down into it and gets, since the substrate isn't like loose, it gets stuck. So that's why like uh, aggregate substrates like uh, um, vermiculite or like soil are best for seedlings and, you know, and the stabilized substrate like rock wool or uh, root riot plugs are best for clones. But I would stick to aggregate uh, aggregate soils when using seeds. Okay, so you uh, you, you touched, touched on this a little bit, like cloning for pheno hunting. Um, and there's a couple, I'm, I'm presenting four different techniques for cloning. And uh, there is a lot of technique to this. So first thing, taking the clone as the top of the seedling, meaning the apical bud of the seedling. I don't know if you can switch the screen, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this, <laughs> you know, like, if the plant is a uh, is is elongated like that, that would be like cutting that top off and then cloning that. That's going to give the plant a really weird expression. Just don't do this. What you want to do instead is let the plant elongate and then take one of the lower buds as your as your clone. If you are flowering that seedling, if you're doing what Travis uh, mentioned there and you're flowering the clones, then that is a totally suitable technique, and you can take that top and then flower that one. That's but very that... interesting to me because usually I won't top the seedling until I'm ready to take cuttings off it. Mm -hmm. I'll take, you know, the top couple, you know, six nodes, like you said, and you can get two cuttings out of it. I'll usually keep the top, top one as the backup and then flower the second level or the like, you know, second shelf, as I call it, kind of. 
So that works fine if you're if you're doing that. Um, what I'm what I'm specifically saying don't do is flower that a topped seedling, a seedling that has the top cut off it. Friend, yeah, that is going to behave super weird. Like that usually grows because of the parallel nose. It's going to grow two mains, and it's like you're really growing that plant in like an odd ball. I, I see style. what you're saying. Right when you um, said don't do this, I was like, that's how I do this. I have yeah, to ask yeah. About that. If you're flowering those clones, then that's perfect. Um, okay. So, but my preferred my preferred technique is to uh, take clones when you're bottom pruning, right when you're ready to go to flower. So the plants are like teens, and what you do is that you don't bother cutting clones off plants that you don't like for flower, right? Um, here's another uh, here's another part of this. You start to number them. The pheno numbers. I've had a lot of like uh, casual, uh, you know, casual cannabis consumers don't know why there's numbers there. Like GG4, like, you know, Gorilla Glue 4. Why is that 4 there? It's because that's the phenotype number. When we move the plants in, you're going to, if you have 25 seedlings or 25 plants that you're flowering, you number them 1 through 25. When you take the clone off them, that's now clone that corresponds to plant number 1. So that's number 1. So when we do the selection, I showed you mellows, mellow seven, eight, and 14. Those were different pheno numbers in the room of like a 25 seed hunt. So anyway, that to me is the lowest labor and highest success rate. And, and then those lowers usually make great clones. So that is a great technique. Other techniques. This is for big hunts. If you clone from promising phenotypes in week four to six of flowering, um, if you're doing, it's very hard to keep clones of a thousand seed pheno hunt. If you can go into a field at week four to six, you have a pretty high likelihood of being able to gather a uh, uh, a clone and reveg it. Revegging takes forever, and it's like not this isn't a great technique, and it might fail. The failure is much fail rate is much higher in this, but um, it's still a pretty good technique if you're talking about doing a low labor um pheno hunt of a lot of seeds and then lastly we have um if you have tens of thousands if you field of ten thousand phenotypes hitting uh trying to get the clone later in flower when you really know wow this is amazing but man flowering a plant that late uh taking a clone and having it be successful that late super super difficult um but you can see that we're juggling essentially labor and effort um uh depending on how many seeds we're growing Trump, Travis, does that make sense? Do you want to embellish on that or is that too much here? Uh, absolutely. And um, I think for the first time ever next spring, I might utilize the hoops to do more of a number three approach, which would be mm -hmm. my first time. That was actually going to be one of my specific questions at the end if you didn't touch on it. But um, that piques my interest because, you know, you got to, I feel, feel like you got to go through at least a hundred if it's something totally unknown, or at least I want to, I want to look at a, a big population. And um, I like that, like clear, concise, laid out approach. It makes sense. And it, all those things are true. Taking the cuts then is like a little easier, but it's still lame and they don't always like root or veg back out and re vegging plants is kind of just lame and <laughs> you a little trick to do it though. You know, like it makes sense. Definitely. A little trick to this as well that I mentioned here is like dig as deep in the canopy as possible because oftentimes the apexes, um, which are typically kind of the best clones, uh, are also the most mature and finished flowers. But if you have a big plant, especially outdoors, if you dig really, if you kind of like get on your hands and knees and like look under, um, you know, like where the presence of the Christmas trees are hiding, you know what I mean? Like getting under that, that's usually really good clone material because they're they're a little bit like more veg and they may, may only have like one or two little buds on them. Yeah, that's good insight. That makes a yeah. lot of sense. Yeah. And I'd rather take 10 of those than take one of everything in a field of 10,000. It's just crazy. Yeah. Um, I know that Humboldt Seed Co. Uh, uses that and I think they've done that before for, for large pheno hunts and it works pretty good for them. Um, cool. Uh, considerations in flowering seeds. Okay. You flower clones all the time. You're an expert grower. What about seeds? Um, there's a couple things that impact this and we're, one thing i will say in a hot take on the comments here will be use cocoa don't use rockwool i love rockwool i love grodan i love i love all those guys they're great but cocoa has a much lower um wilt point for field capacity so there's actually different substrates have like a percent water capacity that then it wilts at 
So cocoa can get to 15% water capacity and not wilt, whereas rock wool wilts at around 20%. What does that mean? If you have a really fast growing plant in the same irrigation and the same substrate in the same room next to a slow growing plant, and you're watering them the same, the fast growing plant is going to get drier much faster. So what that does is cocoa allows you to be a little bit more like forgiving for different plant sizes that might be one might be really wet because you watered it yesterday and grows slow. The other one grows really fast. It's really dry. Those plants aren't, one isn't going to die. So that's a little bit of a tidbit there. Um, you also want to, uh, your bottom pruning or pruning technique might be, you don't really care about yields with a pheno hunt. So uh, you can stack more plants in and bottom prune them higher than a normal plant. So that would be kind of be my recommendation to see, because you only need to see one apex, really. You need to see one bud and bud structure, um, but you don't need like a whole giant plant to know if it's a good pheno. I firmly um, agree with that. It looks like those are like two gallons or so they're in, one gallons even. These are, yeah, these are one gallon pots and look how high they're pruned. So this is actually I, from I, one of our I rooms. do the same thing in my pheno hunt. I like to like let a clone root out pretty much a little bit in there, maybe a couple days and then just flip them all right away. I, I firmly agree with that mm -hmm. approach. The other thing that this allows you to do is if you have any herms on those little bottom prune things, you don't have to be on your hands and knees to see them. You yep. look through at essentially eye level or chest level to see the herms. It's much I feel like with the smaller plant, you can thoroughly look at each one. You can almost look Precisely. at every intersection and kind of just get in a broad. If you have a big, humongous test plant, it's hard to really get in there and intimately check everything out. With that, you can yep. really snoop around. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and things wow. like automated irrigation can be a little difficult, too, if you have much different size plants. Okay. Um, this is a reversed, uh, this is uh, STS. Uh, on a reversed um, black rose plant I, I, uh, we just harvested some seeds from. So this is a good uh, example of a feminized uh, plant. But um, OK, quick crash course on regular versus feminized seeds, because your hunting strategy is going to be pretty significantly different with these different types. Is uh, you know, regular come from a male plant. Uh, uh, regular seeds come from a male plant pollinating a female plant. Feminized come from reversing a female and, and uh, using a chemical agent and then creating pollen from that to make a cross. Uh, compound genetics, we do essentially all reversed feminized seeds. We're, we uh, are obsessed with clones. And what we don't want is to make a seed line from a plant that we don't know how it, what exact traits it has in flower as a female. So we really like to re reverse females because we know exactly what traits we're passing on the next, next uh, uh, generation. Um, so, uh, if you do run regular seeds, I highly recommend using sex testing before you flower so you can avoid the males, unless you want males and you want to start breeding. But I definitely recommend, uh, some great providers of that, such as LeafWorks, Medicinal Genomics, and MyFloraDNA. They all have great, uh, you know, Eleanor at, uh, LeafWorks is, is awesome. And, uh, we love the team there. So, uh, they do great work. Um, okay. Uh, Again, data collection. This is the boring part part of this, but it's still important for people. Use collar tags. One of the most common things, especially with the backup clones and the flowering plants, is you water the plant and the tag either gets buried in the substrate or it gets flooded out of the pot and it's on the table somewhere and you go, fuck, and you lose the corresponding clone. Use collar tags and you will never have this problem. Um, also, uh, you know, numbering and coding creating a, you know, really trying to be thoughtful about that is very important. Um, and then uh, we like to make a map of the room of the different phenotypes. So like if you have just have a tent, you can like look at a piece of paper and remember which phenos are where in the room. So you can like check on them. Okay, I already have that. Um, yeah, selection phases. We have five primary selection phases. Um, the veg phase where we decide, you know, uh, veg phase mid flower to look for those herms because we're going to be killing if it herms. We just kill it off and kill the, kill the clone, right? Upon harvest, post-processing, and then COA and sensory where we're actually smoking it and getting, getting data. Um, uh, you know, key, you know, we're, we're really digging uh, when we talk about uh, the corresponding data metric for each one of these phases, veg, veg speed, like overall health is going to be key for that. The, the uh, herm is going to be huge for the mid flower as well as stretch data. 
and then uh, three is just going to be a uh, is going to be a ton of data on that. That's going to be so much of the plant's morphology, bud structure, color, fade, um, trichome, overall health, yield, so much of that uh, from what we see in the room. Um, post processing things like trim difficulty um, and yields. However, yields can be quite difficult in this pheno hunting phase, right? We just talked about how you're going to bottom prune it weird and you're going to do this and that. Like, yield data is pretty damn like anecdotal and irrelevant for the pheno hunting phase it's much more relevant when you're running the clones a second time um so to me i get my yield data estimates at this phase at the harvest stage not at post-processing by judging how strong the plant is how big the plant is how big the buds are how many buds there are it's bud structure and i guess just over the years as you get an eye for like what a big yielding plant looks like so to speak um this is an example of what like at node labs we do um at each of these, we have like hundreds of these, I think it's like 140 different things we record um, during these, but you can see that we have some like, we try to have some like uh, objective measurements for each one of these phases, right? Resistance to environmental stress is not, is something that like opportunistic. Like if something happens that causes stress, we're gonna say when that one didn't even react to it, wow. If something, if we have a disease or an insect outbreak, and then one of the plants like just doesn't care about it when the other one got hit hard. Okay, here we go. Um, but uh, many of these are, uh, you know, we try to go up with these objective, uh, like numbered measurements and and record each one of these uh, piece of agronomic data. I got, I got this idea to made this protocol from an avocado breeding textbook. <laughs> right? I'm, sorry, I'm a huge plant nerd, so that's that's what I do in my free time. Um, where they graded everything on a one to I was to wondering five. how you dialed all this in. I, you were reading my <laughs> mind. I was like, it's really dialed in. He's like, all the thoughts compiled. This is so cool. Oh, I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I've read a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of uh, really interesting literature on breeding other plants. And a lot of those, uh, a lot of that, it's really, most of it's extremely dense. And uh, a lot of it doesn't apply to cannabis, but the stuff that does is really instructional. I think it's really interesting. And that's like what what the company's doing, no labs and compound genetics. We're trying to bring like high end science and technology, as well as the art and the love of the plant, and just like actually smoking weed and, and grading it and being like, we love this product. Uh, we want to combine those two things: the art and the science. Um, that's what we do. But um, anyway, with uh, with this data collection, this is getting in the weeds of like nerdy stuff. But uh, we have this one through five. Uh, um grading thing but it can't always be quantitative what do i mean by that okay difficulty of trimming like we just want num ones we want very easy right so it's like a golf score like the lower the score the better great right everything that's it's ones all around like what a great plant but there's other stuff that when you're measuring it you can't really put a number like stretch it's not really good to have no stretch it's also not good to have extreme stretch so a lot of these are end up being like threes are the best so we're still struggling with this to say, like, I can't really give it like a score numbers. Oh my God. Like it's a hundred out of a hundred because there's a lot of these things that are kind of more like, well, it just wants to be average. It wants to be manageable. So we're still struggling with that. It's interesting. I feel like that could Super be facility nerd. specific as well, which is interesting. If someone has limited veg space, like they may want a four, maybe not necessarily a five, but maybe a four would fit great there. Precisely. If someone, when they were doing their planning, they ended up with too much veg space. So you could do like some Urkels or Bubba's or whatever stuff that just like crawls along. And I feel like there's a, there could be a strategy if everything else is that important where it's worth keeping in the right facility. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's what we do uh, at Node Labs is go is is we we're doing an overall grade to be like this is great weed and it's it, commercially viable and it smells great and it and it gets it makes you feel great and all those things but also we record these other things that are not necessarily like quantitative or like good or bad but just say like well what works for what do you like to grow you like stretchy stuff okay we have stretchy stuff if you don't like you're better with no stretch oh we have that too but recording it's important you know um and that's kind of where we're trying to really set ourselves apart is uh, provide people elite clones, but also have like all the data and how to grow it. Um, that's really where I, my passion lies. Um, well, advanced pheno hunting techniques. Oh, we do have time to, to plow through this. So um, this should be exciting. Um, 
When's your cutoff at an hour? We have about 10 minutes left or so. Peter? Did you have a cutoff time? Oh, I don't have a cutoff. I th I've just figured it's an hour. For, huh? I'm so used to Zoom meetings. I figure it's an hour and then we have to wrap up. <laughs> well, we can keep going, especially if uh, you're interested in the conversation, which I certainly am. And I'm sure we'll get some uh, some intriguing questions. Oh, let's as well, do it. So. Yeah, let's plot, let's let's get through this. And I'd love to turn it to more of like a discussion afterwards. That sounds great. Awesome. To me. Yeah, I'm sorry. To, yeah. Sorry. I'm just like plowing through this, but uh, no, I'm great. digging it. Yeah, it's great. Cool. Um, all right. So uh, advanced pheno hunting techniques. Node labs. Uh, you know, we're primarily a, uh, you know, we're a breeding and pheno hunting testing facility, but we're also a tissue culture laboratory. And we've developed a process called in vitro pheno hunting, where we germinate the seeds at the laboratory in vitro and they're sterile upon arrival. Um, our darling new seed line clone, which we really think is like the best of the best we're in love with, Gastropop, Gastropop number five specifically, um, was born at the lab. Um, and what we're doing is essentially uh, germinating the seeds in the sterile environment, taking a clone, and then doing exactly the technique you talked about, uh, Travis, where we're taking the clone, and then we're flowering the clone. And then that little seedling, it still lives at the lab to this day. It's never, ever been exposed to a single fungal or bacteria spore in its entire life. And um, we developed this technique when hoplite and viroid was like, super scary and a lot of people were trying to figure out how the heck to manage it we like we consider ourselves like best in the universe at like managing it and we haven't had a positive test in like a year or something like that um but uh we we're we're excellent at managing it but at this point we were like oh my god we have to these elite genetics we have to protect them and what this also does is expedite the tissue culture process by a lot so we can get this done i think it's like 10 months we can get um we can grow it at the laboratory, um, hunt it, test it again in a flowering run, and gather all the data and have it be available at the lab to a commercial client, which is kind of like unprecedented as far as timeline goes. Um, yeah, that's kind of amazing. That's cool. Yes. So, so it's uh, yeah. For for again the Uber like commercial uh, propagation nerds, this is kind of the the top of nerd mountain for that. But uh, we're very excited about this. Uh, um uh, process we did 12 different hunts of this at the lab this year um and we're really excited about like expanding this program it's really cool um okay some cool genetic stuff um all, so many seeds 95 percent of the seeds you see out there these days are like uh f1 generations you know like honey banana by uh, wilson zero it's two different populations crossed but you don't see that many uh, like di digging deeper and going further into the uh, uh, gene pool. And so one of the interesting things to do is to make S1s. Um, that's kind of the shorthand for self-pollinated first generation. But uh, we make a good amount of them when we make seed lines. And what it does a lot of is allow us to learn about the parent and what the, and what the allele frequency at the parents are. This is all great stuff if you're interested in this to just like Google these words. Um, definitely recommend you Google Hardy Weinberg analysis, which is a really fascinating mathematical model to convert allele frequency or like what you see in the field to actually like analyzing the genome. So before they had genome sequencing, that's how they were able to map, quote unquote, map the genome of a plant by using its. Uh, the uh, frequency and and pattern of its recombination. And this is like Mendelian genetics where you start to see some of those recessive traits in the F2 generation or the S1 generation, which are very, very similar. Again, we're not going to dig too deep into this, but uh, really interesting stuff when we're talking about getting to that next phase of pheno hunting and, and breeding is using techniques like this. I like how it was like the most advanced bro science they had before genomics back then. I always marvel at being in the now and looking at it as the past. I wonder how what we're doing now on the cutting edge of medical cannabis will be looked at in like a couple hundred years. You know, it's like, will it be like, well, oh, before this, like these guys were really trying. Like, I love it that it's always the cutting edge of stuff. It's just. Just yeah, you know, I I love I love the idea that um even though the genetic you know uh, gene, uh genomics and genetic sequencing companies and the tools which we're going to talk about in a second are so advanced, 
like there's still so many most of the plants in the world got there with these techniques and you know gregor mendel uh you know crossing p varieties and just being like huh um it's just fascinating that those techniques stood the test of time and are still being used today and to me they're still the most valuable tool tool for cannabis out there um to make great varieties um okay tools for pheno hunting obviously uh potency and terpene analysis is really important especially for commercial growers so uh you know providers like sc labs and bell costa labs are excellent um excellent providers of services that can give you a ton of information when you do those coas purple scientific makes a handheld thc um uh potency um uh measuring device so you can imagine if you're doing a thousand seed pheno hunt boy that helps you screen a lot so what a cool tool to use and uh that's something that i'm really excited to like get more into and employ more um genomics companies are also making a lot of uh tools such as snip chips and other uh, panels. And this is the foundation of marker assisted selection. Um, rapid genomics, Trilogene, uh, LeafWorks, again, medicinal genomics. These are all um, really interesting companies that can provide tools for uh, for those people. And sex testing is probably the most, the most basic version of that. But um, all these companies are working to, to make uh, additional really valuable and really exciting tools that can help pheno hunters not even go to the flowering phase but it's a seedling and you and you put a tiny cutting of a of a leaf and it can tell you for instance um what cannabinoids it should make which is like when we really are able to use those tools to the next level this is going to radically revolutionize uh, cannabis phenol hunting and and breeding um lastly i'll say that uh the art of like actually grading the, the sensory of these in a really specific way is something that i'm really excited about the people pushing this forward and um kevin jodry who uh, uh pioneered the ganji ganjier uh program it's kind of like a sommelier right ganjier program um uh has this really cool principle of uh fruit floral fuel and earth being the kind of cornerstones of flavor and to me um almost like wine tasting like really digging into how you know not just be like oh it smells it's fire but like really digging into all the different aspects of that really fascinate me and um the the perfect tasting event where you really get a lot of people's feedback and you're able to channel all that sensory experience into like data the science behind that is still like the way that's done is still very much uh being pioneered right now and you know the ganjiers are one of the most interesting um uh groups groups out there this thing on the right is something that i just made i really want to adapt it to the uh, ganjier uh map but using something like this and i should be like wow it smells sweet and i go okay what kind of sweet right or it, filling those in those bubbles i think is a cool way to uh guide your palate i like the musky section i feel like that one gets overlooked like kind of like basement sure. terps or carrot terps or just like subtle ones that that get overlooked that aren't that common but are cool nonetheless or, or kind of like a background note, like some of the things, you know, I think uh, more, less less tuned uh, or people, more newcomers to the space usually get like the, I like to call it like the melody, like the forefront knows, but then there's oftentimes a bass note behind it too, something else. And um, if if a, a strawberry, um, a strawberry uh, um, flavor is presented um, with a sour citrus, it comes off a lot different than if it's presented with a cushy cream, right? Those are totally different experience. Both of them smell like strawberry. So um, how you actually present that, and and then I do think um, you know commercial cannabis uh, when when we're actually making these descriptions on the on the you know on the packaging, really actually having the person read something and go ooh like in you know industrial sealant acrid lime lemon apricot hibiscus. And then it like sort of actually smells like that is a lot more com compelling than kind of doing a word salad of, of something that it could smell like that markets. So uh, there's have, a lot more to do. This. Do you have a specific genetic that you were just describing? That was specific. I wanted to know what it was, if it was too. No, so. I just randomly scanned my eyes over that the, <laughs> the slide. Like lemon fuel cleaner, you had me there. And then it kept getting cooler and cooler. <laughs> well, the I mean, the uh, I will say, I will do like shameless plug of this gastropop uh, seed line we have. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and gastropop is uh 
is just really remarkable because it combines some of the like uh some some of the more savory especially like kerosene and and uh, fuel aromas with some really like nice sour and bright berry and like kiwi um it's so it's really remarkable and to me uh the thing that you know i'll, I'll tell you anyone who listens about uh the gastropop aroma specifically because it's selected for aroma is, is that, that a line or that's like one of the selections that you guys did out of the lab yes yeah so gastropop five is uh is a okay, clone number five yep. yeah the clone a clone we have and we just released a seed line uh related yeah. uh, related to it so those are available now and we'll have a lot more crosses coming so get excited about that um and you know, check out our website if you want to uh, learn more about that and uh, purchase seeds. Um, but uh, the thing about that and what we've seen translates to its progeny and what it gets crossed to is that like, if you you smell it and taste it, the taste and the smell don't. Um, it's not like a one. It's not just like that. You know, okay, like kiwi. It it seems to like evolve. It, it's a whole movement. And no one smells that jar and goes, cool, yeah, I got it. Everyone's like smells it and smells it again and again and again. Yeah, and yeah, keep yeah, coming yeah. up with more adjectives and fill in more boxes. That's when we look around and go like, I think we really have something here. Yeah. And it's intriguing and it makes people really think and, and it brings back memories. And um, it's not kind of one dimensional. So that's something we're very, very excited about. When you guys find one that special, are you guys kind of like cracking the jars each day to test it out? Because one like that, I feel like could develop very dynamically through the cure, where if it has Absolutely. that much going on, like each day could almost be like, I use sometimes I like doing a smoke like the first 20 days or so. And sometimes they'll like, it's like a different variety each time. It's fun. Absolutely. Like, and and, and there's some stuff going. like, sorry? Till it gets where it's going, till they all kind of marry and the flavors mellow out. But sometimes they're a trip like on the way to getting there absolutely no uh and the, as it and any commercial producer has to assume that the weed that actually gets sold is going to be more oxidized than whatever you smelled right on the fresh even if you ground it up right after trimming it right so if you are selecting commercially you got to think you got to do what you just did which is like okay crack the jar a month later is it still fire okay awesome right and that profile definitely changes as time goes on so that's a really good point um, some, some stuff seems to like go to that, like kind of a weird, like, uh, you know, I've talked to, I talked recently about, um, certain aromas that like disappear real easy. Yes. Watermelon and cherry to me, it like blows away with like a gust of wind and you're like, <laughs> it's gone. Right. Um, but if you get it right at that fresh moment, it's, it's yes. delightful, but I don't I, think I've had those yeah. same conversations and it seems like mostly fruity ones for us, like specifically this purple diesel that we had in like around 2010, as soon as it was combustible was the best time to smoke it. Like almost still wet, like beasters, like, you know, no, not even fully dry, let alone cured. It had all that grapey flavor, like the least amount of dry, but still combustible. It was so strange. We've nerded out about that too. I don't really get it. <laughs> yeah. And other terps that seem to like last forever. Like you can find, you know, I've talked about like, uh, you know, bags you find in the center console of your car three months later, you're like, uh oh, and you smell it, you're like, that's fire. Like, wow, like, how the heck did that, you know, there's certain things that do that. So, very interesting. Um, uh, so yeah, that, I think that's the, that's the whole presentation. I'd love to, yeah, questions, comments, comment section, um, open it up to whatever we want to do here. Amazing. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's the thiols or something more than just the terpenes. Like that's something that we speculate about just from like, you know, uh, you know, just our point of view or whatever, but it's gotta be something different that like it cures away and becomes like plantier and like more hay, like as it should be at the sweet spot. Some of them are like yeah. that. It definitely intrigues me. Well, like going back to the ganji thing too, the nose is still the best tool for actually determining quality. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, terpene tests, like they can tell you a lot and it's important. Um, but, uh, here's a really great example. Um, gmo starfighter wi-fi cut we have which is like freak plant but um heavy on the gmo it's like a rotting it's like rotting gym socks like disgusting it, it's extremely foul smelling right it has like the same exact terpene <laughs> analysis as one that like smells like grapes <laughs> it's like what so the terpene analysis can't tell me that this is absolute accurate you know, disgusting. Like it's it's not doing enough. And the nose, you give that to anyone, it's not subtle. Like it's rank. So very interesting example of that. 
Um, it's, I haven't found uh, a question yet, but one thing that I wanted to touch on uh, to get some feedback, I feel like if you have enough space, putting the, uh, the testers into a room that is about done with flowering to get their initial set going so that even if there is some rogue pollen that you don't catch, there's a minimal chance that it's going to cause any problems. And then if that room is going in, staying in flower, you'll get kind of like the first three weeks of the next round where they're not necessarily like full flower yet. So they're not vulnerable. So I wanted to ask, like, if you have any thoughts on that, that's something I try to employ, employ every time if the situation is available, just because like it just minimizes the risk of pollen flying just in case you miss a herm or something, you know. Explain that to me again. You're talking about like layering different runs of flowering. Exactly. So let's say flower room one is eight weeks done with flower on a 10 week flower run. You mm -hmm. put your tester clones that are all rooted in their one gallon into there. You let them, you know, sit in there for two weeks. They're just starting to show what they're doing. That room clears out. And then the, now that that room is on day zero, day one of flower, those, uh, those seed, those testers, are going to have another three weeks really or so before the plants are vulnerable to, to pollen because they're just flipping. They're just kind of still vegging essentially. Mm -hmm. So that's a strategy that I've uh, grown to employ from, you know, making mistakes. And uh, I feel like if you can do that, it helps minimize the chance of pollen flying around. Then by the chance, by the time the flower room is actually setting in, you should know by then or it's probably sterile pollen that's going to fly, you know, is like my thought process. Or it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, uh, even if it gets pollinated at week seven, it can't form a seed at that point. It's like just going to be a little like, you know, micro, yeah. nothing. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, that's an interesting technique to use. I mean, I think that would be for like a home grower technique. I don't think that that would be something employed commercially, but. Uh, yeah, space is like too important on like scale. Yeah. But I um, feel like to prevent something wrong happening, like if they did dedicate or engineer that space in the room and kind of plan it into the SOPs, I think. I think it could help alleviate problems, even for big grows. It takes up space. It takes time, but well, uh, that, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, like, I mean, this goes back to the slide of like growing strategy that like the grow strategy for pheno hunting, you got to like really think like, wait, we could break all the rules here. You know what I mean? This is like different. Right. Yeah. So um, one of the things I've thought of is like, what about high throughput um, pheno hunting in like, you know, four inch tall plants, something like that. Right. Just to screen out, some initial, you know, for, for a grow strategy where you're just yeah. trying to find a certain terp or something like that. Right. Yeah. It's something you could do. And I think it would be really interesting. Um, I'd love to go to the, the comment section if we can get some questions or anything like that. Uh, Absolutely. I was just scrolling through before. And uh, if anyone has any comments, throw them in there. I've been busy rolling my blunt as usual, but. Um, I, so Chilbert from uh, UK has a, uh, not be, uh, not be topped when pheno hunting. Um, if it's running from the seedling, I wouldn't recommend it because if you have the parallel node sites, you kind of get an oddball plant morphology from that. And, uh, we talked about that a little earlier that like you can top it if you then use that clone and flower that clone. But if you're flowering the plant, don't top the, don't top the plant. Here's one that just popped up that I could uh, go on for days about. At what point should we be renaming things? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, maybe we won't go there because I can go <laughs> and on that one. So I have a lot of firm opinions. What, what, dude, hot take. What, what's your opinion? Okay, what's what's? let me ask you, hot seat. What's a cultivar? Is, is, is uh, what's a common one? Is skunk number one a cultivar? Hmm. Well, uh, we've, you've, you've, it's, it's, this is kind of odd. If there's a number next mean. to it, there's a number next to it. I assume there? it's a clone and it's a cultivar, but I know people have like sold seeds of skunk number one. So I think the rules are getting a little blurry at this point. There's no set hard rules. And, and, you know, there are uh, rules once cannabis, if cannabis gets federally legalized, the USDA will actually enforce this shit, which is like yeah. kind of crazy to think about, yeah. but, uh, but like, you won't be able to sell that. They'll be like, you can't number that. That's a cultivar. There'll be a cultivar yeah. registry, which other plants have. There's like a, a list. Yeah. Um, I personally don't like that term, how it gets used in cannabis, almost similar to phenotype, where it's like, what does it really mean? Because it seems like to me, if someone got a pack of skunk number one, 
they're going to call that a skunk number one cultivar where there's got to be tens of thousands of those on the planet. You know, to me, it should be that one genetic, whether it's some a sister, whether it has sisters or many sisters, you know, mm-hmm. it's the one genetic. And it's like, that's when names change to me. If it's special enough to be its own genetic, it should have its own name. It's not skunk number one anymore. Now it's pot of gold or your Exodus cheese or any of the number of well, I'll, very I'll, individual ones that came from skunk number one. To me, like UK cheese <clears throat> deserves a name. You know, the other 10,000 that came from skunk one that aren't that special. Like, So you're touching on a really important point, Travis, which I think, and this is kind of the 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 general rule of thumb but i try to follow too if you make a cross and it's really something new like it has a new expression it should get a new name um if it's just like another improved version of the parents you know it could just be like or you might see stuff like uh uh sour diesel bx you know what i mean it's like you're just trying to work the sour diesel line you're not yeah. trying to be like you know you know yeah lo- lobster lobster kush you know what i mean you're not trying to like that's that's kind of weird so I think we should be naming more according to like what profile or like what the plant is actually like and stop doing too much word salad. I don't know. Yeah. Um, really quick that a uh, in line, it has to be special enough. Like you say, if it's something new and it's like, but that's where I get muddled up. So like, then what does cultivar actually mean? Because you can't name every skunk number one. It's like, you just have to say my genetic or like the genetic I'm running. I feel like you have to be very vague since none of us, can convey exactly what we're talking about <laughs> exactly um we have some really interesting comment here from genetic memory farms um talking about fruit flavors being esters so esters thiols flat and flavonoids being like a kind of broader category of that we definitely need to discover more of the actual chemical profiles not discover them but be uh essentially have cheaper ways of doing it um, mass spec and uh chromatography is probably the best thing but um Boy, it's not really, you know, the test can't exactly tell us if something smells just yet. Um, very interesting. Um, How do you feel about running a big pheno hunt in a large container instead of necessarily four inch containers? So I was thinking like, let's say a 20 gallon smart pot, 30 gallon smart pot, 40 X, Y, Z, and just throwing like, you know, 50 seeds in that and start calling them early. Like ones that are just showing that they're probably not it. And then by the end, maybe having like, you know, five, 10 left in there. And at least like you say, if you're going for a certain aroma or something specific, you can at least kind of look through a bunch and not so much space, you know? So I think one of the problems with that, uh, and this goes to my like evolutionary biology background, your main screening, your main evolutionary pressure, like selection pressure is competitive advantage how well does it compete against its friends right okay if you don't care about if, if if you then grow in that way and then you don't care down the line you don't care how well it competes against its friends because you're not going to grow it like that then like why apply that pressure because you might have a seedling that gets overpowered by its friends you go, ah and you kill yeah, it and that might have been the one sense. you know like yeah um so i mean it's an interesting and again like with the clone strategy we talked about earlier of uh you know going in week four to six if you just like sow seeds, <laughs> like Johnny Appleseed over there, <laughs> that's a great strategy. Grow them. If you see something really special, cl- clone the backup. But I think that's a great strategy for people who have properties, who have, uh, you know, who have houses in large yards, you know, live up in Humboldt or, uh, you know, in one of the more rural areas of, of California or, or, uh, or the world and can easily grow a lot of seeds. Like do that. Like you don't have to do what we do, which is like carefully logging each and every seedling in each and every plant. Yeah. You know. I was kind of just thinking that, like, maybe do it just as the main focus, the, like, the top priority would be just to observe the population mm-hmm. with a second or third approach as, like, if something special pops up, of course, try to keep it. But maybe really just to, like, look at a big population and then the competitive kind of just fits in with it. Survival of the fittest. I'll just get to observe and learn, you know? Of course. Um uh Yeah, so I'd, I'd love to put a link on uh, – some people are asking about a – um uh a link to uh buy seeds um i can put that uh so here at uh, compoundgenetics.com i think we actually have some website problems at the current moment but uh stay on with that and we uh and we we can buy seeds there um uh get seeds from the partners then i'll also post post in uh the our discord which is a really great um channel to get into if you if you like content like this 
we actually I actually do like an AMA every uh, every month. And we just update like all the different breeding uh, uh, breeding projects and talk about pheno hunting and, you know, and do stuff like, you know, just look through all the different jars of all the different phenos and, and just talk through them and stuff like that. It's kind of engage our community. So it's a lot of fun. Getting a lot of, uh, a lot of hate on the Ganji program. Yeah, I have my opinions, but I won't go there. One thing I will say is that I heard one of them talking about how Purple Punch was their go-to recently, and that really made me question the whole universe, not just their program. So <laughs> like, I, I, I pride myself on finding good in every genetic that comes in my way, except for Blackberry Kush and Purple Punch. Like, I truly just don't like those ones. I think they should be purged from the culture. And uh <laughs> To hear someone that has the rubber stamp referencing that as his go-to just made me question everything, not just them. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not going to, you know, I don't know. I, I can't endorse individual preferences or flavors, but I think the, uh, what, what I'm trying to draw on is that is they're trying to create some standardization behind it. They're trying to create a shared lexicon and I yeah. hear way too much. If that's fire. And it's like, what what else what else you got there and it's like it's fire it's like i want to i want to be able to look at like a you know talk about some of those flavors and talk about why they're there and how we're picking those up purple punch doesn't have a flavor it's like wizard (laughs) smoke like what what, what's your say from that i mean this is what you do like what's your opinion on purple punch let's go there it's all opinion bear in mind you know it's 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 a it's a really strong greenhouse grower i don't care for the flower i'm not going to smoke it you know yeah garbage i'm not going to smoke it um but you know, Symbiotic did an awesome job with that uh, being a uh, being an incredibly uh, stable um, and reliably purple fading, um, and and like we got to put we got to give Purple Punch uh, its its due its due uh, credit, which is that it, it. it it has the like look. It. it it helped it helped to develop the look that we all want now. Right. Does it have the turp? No, but it's a stepping stone. It's it's in the evolution of this game. I think it's, so. it's, it's very true. It has respect if it doesn't have much love from me. That's <laughs> that's I would agree with that. I think that's I think that's agreeable. Um, but uh, you know, flavors flavors wise, uh, you know, I'm really into like uh sour flavors. Um, I really want to see more like chem and sour uh uh you know, like citrus aromas, but not, but the ones that really make your, like, make you pucker when you smell it. Um, uh, real chems that, that don't, chems with bag appeal is something that we're really trying to dig through, pur- uh, purple coloration of, of chems. Um, and I really also like some of the incensing, like herbal smells, like um, some of those really interesting, like Afghanis uh, and um, some of the stuff that, um you know, a little plug here of a, uh, um, uh count uh, or i'm probably gonna butcher the name arazenig i think the Af- Af- afghani project um uh seed line where um i dig, dig dug through all the different land races in afghanistan um i know that he's really stoked on some of the like rotting animal terps and uh foul uh incensey uh uh some terps that you like really don't see very often unless you're working with like a gmo but I'm really into a lot of those different flavors. I don't know what the chat thinks about some of that, but um, I'm stuck on the NL5 uh, hazy ones right now. You know, it's the oh, culture, all right, all right. culture calls it a million things, but I'm really on that like flavor right now for sure. Well, the uh, um, the uh, obviously the haze terp like terpinaline is a uh, is the favorite ha- thing to hate these days as well. Um, I think this one's actually usually Mercine dominant, like the, you know, most of these versions of the NL5. Okay. Yeah, I see, uh, I see some uh, apple fritter talk in here and stuff like that, but uh just need some compound gear. It's just about to get some of that flavor back, but... uh <laughs> How about you guys for uh, for washers? Are you guys focused on that? Do you guys have good feedback just by you know by chance without focusing on it? Did anything pop up that was interesting? What's what's your take on that? You know, absolutely. Uh, there's a couple things with uh, washing that's really interesting. Uh, we're definitely getting more into that. We're working with a uh, Kalia extracts and a lot of that, um, and we do like kind of a test washing program with Kalia, and they just do awesome work. Kalia extracts there, Mark there just just kicks ass, um, but. Um, uh, 
we we do test often do test washes and uh dan on our team is kind of like the dab the dab master as far as like really really getting into it and being really connoisseur of the aroma and texture and um experience of of especially solventless extract um but um yeah we've definitely found some recent like uh three percent plusers we've gotten some five percenters um uh, I'm also working with uh, BioVortex, Jesse, uh, Jesse Dodd of BioVortex to um, uh, work some cherry lime dog crosses that are like legendary for washing efficiency. So uh, if we have any cherry lime dog uh, Northern California fans in the chat, I'd love to hear about that. But uh, really love. Uh, when you say washing efficient efficiency, my antenna pop up. Does that encompass <laughs> ease of growing, biomass per square foot, harvest, and wash, or just nope. focused on the actual after it's frozen, frozen and beyond? Frozen and beyond, just that. Okay. It's it's literally it's it's a specific trait of how easily the trichome head yeah. like falls off the stock. Yeah. And yeah, it's remarkable. We just watched. I, thought, that I like, thought you guys were already on like the whole thing. I was like, okay, let's go. Like, <laughs> take me there. <laughs> um. Okay, I see uh, uh, turgidity um, saying uh, cedar and pine, pining. Yes, I'm all about pining. And pining is like kind of dead these days. Like you don't see it that often. I want more pining strains for sure. Um, I see somebody talking about the strawberry cannoli in there as well. That's the ta That's probably the tastiest dab I had in 2022. That was, uh, I think it tested 11.5% terps. And when the lab called them, they were like, this has to be a mistake. They're like, no, we already double tested it and sent it out what? to other labs. They're like, it already, Wait, and we sent it out to other labs. It's legit. So, oh my God. Uh, it, it wasn't too stony because it was so terpy and it hurt the throat a little bit. You had to take like a little cooler dab or a baby dab. But oh my God. It was more strawberry than artificial strawberry, like jam or something, or like a strawberry freezy pop. It was more strawberry than like a real one. It was crazy. Whose gear is that? I'm curious now. I haven't seen that around. That sounds very I'm sad. not sure. I just know uh, the homies who uh, run it are uh, Aloha Apothecary. And then okay. Mission Hill is uh, washing it for them. But I think that's the first time I bought hash in over a decade. And it was worth it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I got to check that one out. 11% terps. That seems, yeah, that seems like mind-blowing. 3% is high. What are we talking they about? They had here? three different sun-grown varieties this year that weren't genetic, too genetically related that tested over 10%. And these were all like double tested because the lab didn't believe it either. And uh, they're oh doing, so they're up to something. Wow, very exciting. I think the highest one was almost 13, like 12.7 or something obnoxious. It's crazy. Well, this is where the uh, the sun-grown guys really just smash all the terpene numbers. No one can compete with that. And, you know, I'll, I'll go on the hot mic and say that the best cannabis in the world is grown by the uh, living soil, um, uh, sun, you know, often sun-grown um, or greenhouse protected. But it's got to be living soil grown, and that's the best of the best in the world to me. Um but it's such an art. It's like it's an art form to do it like that, and um, I commend anyone who's is, who grows in that style for sure. I'm pretty sure they're regenerative, and uh, the crazy variable though is it's the uh, main sun, uh, New Eng Northern New England outdoors, and uh, so it could have been a positive stress, but they really crushed it. Definitely, definitely. Um, any more questions on the presentation on the? Uh, on the uh chat here i'd love to see what you guys think about um you know if this is helpful for you guys for pheno hunting at home or um or if you had any questions about some of the lexicon or you know stuff we're working through on on the actual presentation or if we just want to get more into flavors or yeah whatever whatever you whenever you think there travis how many of you do you usually run through for flavor testing? Because this is actually something I'm kind of concerned with this time. I have so many winners. Like I was saying, there's 10 at least that I have to run again. And I only have so much flour because they were small plants. And I'm wondering, should it be me over a couple mornings or a trusted mouth or two? Or like, what, what's your guys' approach on that when it comes to actual human smoke response? So you get, that's a great question. Cause you do get kind of a paradox here. Like I joked around with, uh, uh, one of my coworkers being like, okay, new protocol. We have to smoke each pheno three times. 
<laughs> in the morning. <laughs> and there's 150. <laughs> it's like, oh, fuck? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're all like, we'll never go back to work again. Uh, so uh, I, there is some limit to that. You know, yeah. um, that said, smoking 15 joints in a night, like, what are the chances the 15th is the one you'll be like, wow, this is so like, you're always going to be weighted towards the first or second you smoke. Um, yeah. I, I really don't know how to reconcile that, but that's also why we have like tasting events where we try to get a lot of mouths. Like, yeah, like, like you said, we try to get as many trusted good noses and, and people who know their flavor and know their weed. And usually it's, it's surprising. Usually everyone independently goes, you know, we all click to the same stuff. And we have found, for instance, that gastropop is something that um, it, I think it was like the ninth joint of a night. And everyone's like, this is amazing flavor. And I was like, okay, if it has amazing flavor. Yeah, and that's it's the ninth you joint. Said it, if one okay. does shine that late, you know, it's a super, you know, super yeah. shiner. Yes, exactly. And it's that translation from smelling the smelling the bag. This is something we're working a lot, too. And the gastropop line is we're really, really working is. You smell the jar and you're like, ah, oh, it smells so good. And you smoke it and it just smells like, like, you know, nothing. It doesn't taste like anything. It just, just tastes like hot smoke. What I want is that smell and then the similar flavor to kind of coat the inside of your mouth. That's always, and if it, if it cuts through, you know, Jimmy Devine of uh, LA Weekly, uh, he's always talking about like, he always rolls, he rolls up a lot of blunts. And if it cuts through that too and it tastes good, it's like, you have something really special. So, you know, absolutely. Uh, dude, Nick, a T too, uh, really changed my look at it too. He's like, everyone's baseline is different. Cause he catches a lot of heat for smoking. The spliffs is kind of like his normal go-to. And he's like, trust me, I can taste the difference. Like, this is my baseline. I know when it's good or bad, just cause it might not taste good to you. It's like, trust me. Like, so that really changed my outlook on it. And I think with that too, like you said, it'll, it'll shine better certain ways too, you know, like you can make some, some rosin, even if it gets a low yield, it's probably going to taste all right. But like you put it through, you know, some dirty old crusty pipe or a cigar, like, well, we did, uh, you know, we did do uh, one of our last tasting events with proper doinks, which are like, uh, you know, they make the glass tips for like the, they're like crazy connoisseurs about having like the perfect joint and that white ash and everything. And I was, I'll, I'll say I was a little bit skeptical, but um, they know what they're talking about, and it actually does make a really big difference. So I would bristle. I would bristle at a mixing tobacco into a spliff. I mean, I would. That's just not me. That said, if that's how people like to smoke, then that's how people like to smoke. Like whatever. Yeah. But uh, the proper joints guys know what they're doing, and some of those glass tip joints are pretty pretty cool these days. I'm I'm into it. I love that if they're actually getting into the airflow engineering of smokables. Because me and my peeps have been nerding out on that like unofficially for so long where it's like there's words that we don't know how to describe what we're saying. But we're always trying to talk about like what makes it burn better, where there has to be a little more airflow and less. And if those guys are actually like crunching that out, that's so intriguing. Oh, yeah. They're, no, they're like they're like super scientific about it. And it's uh, and they're also like obsessed with the flavor. It's 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 really, really involved. You should check it out. Proper doinks. Joint engineering. I love that. Joint engineering. Yeah. I can't uh, believe that's a real thing now. Like my younger self wouldn't believe that. Um, um, I'm trying to get a link to the uh, uh, Discord before we. Uh, where the heck is that? Do you guys offer through just dispensos too? Like, do, do you guys have a distributor where it's like, you know, if you wanted to go to, uh, there's one in Pacifica, I think Lyft. Maybe they usually carry cuts and stuff. Is that how people can get your action too, or is it usually just yeah? You know what, like um, large gardens or you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna plug our one of our uh, our beloved salespeople, Matthias. And hey, Matthias, hey, could you come here? You're you're on the podcast now. Um, people are asking where they can get compound genetic seeds or uh, or clones, flower, all of the above. Can we talk? Can we give them some? Uh, talk about where people can source uh, compound genetics and Node Labs gear. Yeah. What's up, everybody? Hope I'm having a great day. Um, Matthias Newton, pleasure. Nice to meet you, Matthias. Travis. Likewise, Travis. Pleasure to meet you, man. Um, yeah, the best place I would say to get that list would be on our Discord page. Uh, okay. Compound has a, a verified vendors list. It's um, it's a sub channel that we have on our Discord page. 
Um, hmm, can we throw a link in the comments here or? Um, yes, I'm not the most technically equipped to do that, but I know we can. I think if you pull it up on your screen and then just kind of share it under the present on the bottom, mm -hmm. I Let's think see. you can do it that way. Cool. Awesome. Are you, are you guys usually in like different stores in the Bay or like surrounding areas though? Like, is it kind of accessible to get your guys stuff if people are interested? Yeah. Yeah. So on that list, um, there's stores in California that hold our, hold our, uh, hold our beans. Um, you can go there. Our online stores is being re uh, renovated. So typically you can go to our, our website and you can get directed to buy seeds there as well. But um, that's down for the next couple of weeks being kind of renovated. So Discord's kind of the best place to source it at the moment. Um, and I, yeah, thanks, Chris. And then any uh, basically online, um, uh, I mean, a bunch of seed banks that are that are carrying our gear, uh, stuff from Grape Gas Collection to um, all the way to the newest stuff, the Grape Gas that we just brought out. So. Um, that's what, that's the best place. Uh, you could get lucky with some retailers across the state. There's probably like five or six that might be holding inventory. Uh, that's from Northern to Southern California. So awesome. Yeah. I saw someone on here ask if you wanted to touch on a uh, mono terps and sesquiterp. <coughs> hey, let me pass it back to Chris. Pardon me. I'm not sure if that's in your wheelhouse. Okay, cool. Bro. Yeah, that's that's a science, more of a science question. I could I could touch on it, but I'm not going to give you the best information. Yeah, me as well. <laughs> right on. Take care, everybody. Peace. Right on, brother. Hello, um, Travis. Could you let me know how to do a comment here? Can Can you help me out um, with that? So, um, if you go down to the bottom, is there a post a comment section on the right? If not, I think I can. Hopefully Chris comes back, but I'll hang loose for a minute. Been a groovy conversation. Super stoked. Fired. Okay. Um, so you see down in the bottom how there's the present button? Uh, yes. So if you open up another window, another tab, then uh, it's pretty easy to share on there. If you wanted to post a comment into the the um, the chat, you can just read it off to me, and I think I'm allowed to put links there. I think you have to be verified to leave a link. Okay, I just uh, I just put it in the private chat. Okay, cool. That'll work. And uh, yeah, what's up with the Discord? Tell us what's cool there. What's uh, what's going on? So we have like a lot of updated information in all of our seed lines. Uh, like I said, I do like a monthly AMA to talk about um, what we're breeding, what we're working on and stuff. Uh, we have, um, you know, we have different like, uh, you know, it's just a whole community. And, and you can also put your, um, you can ask about grow styles. You can ask about, um, you can get like support on being like, how do I grow this right? Or you can get support from me as well as uh, the rest of our team on like grow tips, pheno hunting, uh, just just hey like my plants don't look right like help or like what's this insect it's like any anything all of the above and learn about and then be the first to learn about our new seed drops clone drops all all the events and everything like that awesome i think we got it up there so people are interested they can just click and check it out killer cool about that you have anything else to touch on chris anything interesting oh someone did ask if you want to go down uh, some of this rabbit hole they oh, wanted boy. you to uh, describe the difference between monoterps and sesquiterps. I think we were kind of loose on that between the blunt and like other different things, but uh, someone seemed interested in that. If you wanted to touch on it, oh boy. Um, if not, it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's well, I I can touch on it, but it's it's more it's it's like a it's it's a chemistry question. That's it's uh, I don't think it's actually that um, impactful as far as like how it's uh, how your body's. Um, uh taking it in i think it's a chemical structure thing um and how and how they're built together so i'm not sure if it's that um relevant it, you know it's it's essentially uh, I'm, i just googled it two seconds ago monoterpenes are two isoprene units sequiterpenes are three so essentially just structuring of the of yeah. the terpenes and, and the different ca categorization on those yeah and I think for general layman's, like one's a little more volatile, one sticks around a little longer. They probably play together pretty well most of the time. And, you know, and, yeah. But like we said uh, and, and touched on before, uh, you know, all these flavonoids and all these different 
things are actually well the terpenes are kind of like the base layer of that but all those are really the what gives you those distinct flavor and aroma experiences oh my god raspberry it's like a terpene cannot tell you that um and it's probably really distinct um you know esters and things like that that are presenting those those flavors um and then thiols too uh, the other fascinating thing i mean here's something about uh sense sensory um uh science in your brain which is that um your brain and your nose aren't like equal opportunity when it comes to aromas you it doesn't you don't say like oh well, like 50 parts per million like 100 parts per million your nose can favor things that are extremely difficult to detect with science and be an overwhelming scent to your brain without actually being in high concentrations so those thiols um that are uh uh those thiols that are highly you know that are like the gas terps and everything like that i think that gosh i i don't know the off the top of my head but the concentrations are tiny to to present a really intense point aroma three, experience point three to make your neck jerk yeah yeah exactly um and uh it, it, a really like interesting example of that is like even just like uh what is it like hydrogen sulfide is something like that it, it's a foul smell that your nose can detect because it's so toxic too. So you got to think your nose is actually evolved to detect things to, for survival. Um, and one of them is uh, food that has gone bad that's going to get you sick. You can smell it of much like those things tend like to a register. Multiplier from what you're saying almost. That's very interesting where some stuff our brain is trained to intensify. Like Right. That's very interesting. So it's like psychometric. So it's not really fair. And uh, and there's some things we just can't smell, like water is odorless to us. Other animals can smell water, and there's a distinct smell of water. So the way our nose interprets stuff is not necessarily fair or equal. It's highly based on you know what we've evolved to have a little slot for that says "ding" and then makes yeah. makes an experience for us. Okay. I'm, I'm seeing i'm seeing some i'm seeing some okay i see genetic memory who seems to really know his shit about um terpenes yep. get some corrections on a uh, on uh mono and sesquiterpenes that monos are more volatile so maybe those monos are more uh you know we're talking about the ones that uh go away more easily so this is really interesting information um but uh yeah i want to say like I, I love the in these type of experience i love the chats because like Nobody, you know, nobody knows everything. And uh, I, I highly welcome any corrections or uh, new information or if people uh, have, uh, you know, backgrounds or experiences that otherwise, uh, there's a lot to discover in this plant still. So uh, pretending like it's all figured out is we're not even close, not close. That's what I was saying, like looking us in the present, but from a past point of view in the future, like we're really at the infancy. It's so fun, you know, like I love it. Like it's a it's a great place to be if you love cannabis, you know, like in cannabis history. Like I feel like they'll look back at this time and be like, man, they were swinging for the fences. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I mean, we. I mean, the, here's a here's an interesting thing, though, like uh again the evolutionary bio biology background comes a lot like when i'm in my perspective here during prohibition what you had is like the same thing as like everyone on an, an island everyone's tent grows and and warehouse backyards and you know uh sunset district of, of san francisco garages yeah, were like a little island and they were breeding in that little island there was limited amount of ability to exchange cuts I mean, now with like, I mean, lemon cherry gelato and stuff like that, like it's really, it's homogenizing fast, guys. Like a lot of this diversity is getting bottlenecked really, really hard. Um, it's really important that a lot of people in this game who really love um, new, you know, flavors, classic flavors and and new stuff, like keep it around. And we, we can't lose that diversity. So I think, I, I do think the way things are going, the prompt, the the nirvana, like the 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 golden age was probably... Uh, probably like 10 to 15 years ago, maybe, um, maybe, maybe even five years ago. And I think we're starting towards a little bit of a homogenization of flavors yeah. just by the, by the way that um, these big markets and a lot of legalization, it's just how it is.
I see a small scale rebellion at least. I hear a lot of narrative of green bud, which just sounds funny to me because that's such an old school term or like green weed, green bud is like what people want. They don't even care about the strain as long as it's not purple. It's like, I don't know. I see at least a mini rebellion, maybe not on the big scale, but like I think people are really searching out the ones that worked, you know, and it might not be in the California necessarily, a California market necessarily, but I think even ones that are going to test low are going to start being like, more demanded just because of the effects and the flavor more than the number as people smoke enough like the numbers mm -hmm. going to impress them less and less than the yep. experience so i don't know i speculate at least some some sort of a rebellion in 2023 for green bud <laughs> i yeah, i agree i mean i think green bud's coming back and and that's that's what i'm talking about with uh, those chems too is like yes, i yeah. want the piney sour chems and i don't give a shit if it's green um i want that smoke experience which i really kind of miss um yeah. I'm seeing, uh, I, I have to answer this question from Peter here, which is, uh, how was the weed at UVM? Dank. <laughs> Dank. It was great. Um, and that's like where, I mean, Boston, growing up in Boston and uh, going to UVM, is like sour diesel was king. Um, and if you can get the right bag of sour diesel, it's just like, that's really the only thing people want. So that East Coast sour diesel was really where it's at. And uh, other than that, you might just get some other like, sort of like classics, I feel like people who bought seeds from some of the Dutch guys, like White Widow or, uh, um, uh, you know, um, what others like train wreck and white widow and gg4 stuff like that was like really big. Um, or like even like sensi crosses and shit like that. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I love Vermont. And if there's any Vermonters in here, then we love you green mountain boys for the win. Go catamounts. That's Montpelier, right? Burlington, Burlington. That Burlington, okay. It's cool. um, yeah, I was on Cesar Chavez for a stretch in the city, and uh, we were doing our thing at Cesar Chavez and Mission. Pretty much, it was it was it was interesting. It was great. <laughs> So many fun genetics back then. I just found a big list of what like the Bay had to offer in 2005 for genetics. It's so interesting. Like there's still some land race stuff on there, like Mazari Sharif and like the Cali O and stuff like that. And like hmm. the new ones were like, you know, bubblegum crosses or like <laughs> train wreck was like the hard to get one, you know, like it's just, it's just really interesting uh, throwback. You know, uh, I want to do another, uh, where you talk, jumping back to solventless hash really quick, do another shameless plug of the, uh, the, the grape gas line we made. Oh, I'm trying to center this. You can see behind me. Um, we absolutely love everything from that seed line. And it's it kind of like becoming sort of legendary at this point, I think. Um, but uh, the grape gas S1, um, if you can get your hands on any solventless hash from that, it's like mind blowing. And the first year and a half of people running that cut, it's a pretty fast finishing cut. Didn't really test well. Then people started to harvest because solventless hash uh, efficiency is dramatically affected by harvest date. So you can have like a, a bell curve of if it's a nine week strain, if you put it all the way in nine weeks, it's going to be like, eh. And if you harvest it just the right day at seven and a half or eight weeks or eight and a half weeks, something like that, it could be like super efficient, right? So I think a couple uh, influential solventless hash makers um, uh, started to run that cut. And like, guys, if you can get your hands on it, the grape, like sweet dimatappy artificial grape, like grape lollipop, it's profound. It's really, really something. It's an extremely, extremely distinct strain. And, uh, and anything from the grape gas line is pretty dominant with that terp. But uh, I absolutely love that. And if you ever have a bag of grape gas, I'm going to be like, let's, let's, let's hit that. And uh yeah, how's the how's the favorites. dump on the uh, that one? Is it just special enough for the flavor and effect, or does the does yield come along with it well? Is it respectable at least, or is it more like a connoisseur like head stash one? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's more about uh, how I think it's become more efficient as people. So that's why I mentioned it, as people have figured out the timing. I think it's yeah. become efficient. Yeah, you said it was quick. But, to start. Yeah, our initial runs were like super inefficient. We're like, ah, shit. So. Um, you know, I do, th yeah, I, it is, um, I think it is becoming a staple for a couple, uh, for a couple of the sash makers that, uh, um, just, uh, go, you know, Google it, you know, go, go on Instagram, dig around and, uh, and, uh, if you find it, get it. 
I feel like that's an interesting metric that isn't really standardized either. I feel like from my point of view, it's like grams of frozen biomass per amount of space per time. And then with the variable of cost of inputs, you know, whether it be like housing the plants, labor and power and all that. I feel like that touches all the variables, but I feel like there's so many ways that people describe how solventless yields. I'd love to see like how you guys talk about it. Yeah. That's like variable. Like I, like I was just saying in my equation, at least if you can get enough biomass per square feet and then time goes way down, it doesn't have to yield high. Like yep. it works on the year, you know? Well, and the, and the big thing these days in the, in the game too, is like a buds, right? Like, you can have a strain that has a lot of B buds, like little small buds or something like that. Polarized. And if you're washing, it just doesn't matter, right? Same thing too with big buds. The other thing is you can have a bug that bud that's too big. If you're a brand that sells eighth jars, like buds that are like that, like you have to like saw them in half and then you have these like weird shaped buds and that doesn't work. Everyone wants the perfect like size, right? So big buds as well are grapple pie cut, which is grape gas by apple fritter. Um, washes at like four percent and it's like huge like they're freaking huge massive spears so that's in another one that's the yields huge because the plant's huge not necessarily the efficiency so um yeah that is an interesting uh subject that travis you could probably we could probably go on another two hours which is called resource use efficiency <laughs> which uh takoshi kozai um Toyoshi kozai excuse me um of the university of chiba japan uh pioneered and if you want to get into, if you want to get into that, just Google Toyoshi Kozai. Um, he has a really, uh, he used like mathematical equations to like to run vertical farming, and and uh, he he's part of the group of people who make like the special strawberries. I don't know if you heard these like fifty seventy five dollars strawberries and stuff, but like no. they're really they're really really interesting. Um, Sherry Kubota of the University of Ohio as well is extremely influential from that, but uh. Yeah, if you're into that sort of stuff, they like measure resource use efficiency. That's something I'm trying, really trying to get into, and uh, it's extremely complex. And I, when it opens up, I want to go over there. So anyway, really interesting. Yeah, that'd be awesome. It seems so many nuances and intermoving parts where it's like, yeah, that'd be an interesting read to see someone who's like thought about it for a while. Definitely, definitely. Um, cool. Well, what do you think? Did you see any more interesting questions or comments, or should we wrap it up for the evening? Regular, uh, reading through here, a couple of comments, something about seizures, but I don't know. I think it's to us. Okay. It's, it's someone else. Um, Georgia pie is a great cut. Wonderful, wonderful cut. Uh, I don't know if I can change straight strain list. Um, we'll be updating our website really soon, Andre. So just stay, stay tuned and you can check out the whole list. Um, but uh, you know, uh, I will. I will. Uh, uh, you know, I will uh, take us um, uh, again. Uh, grape gas. If you want to get the grape gas line, just stay on with the website and log on to the Discord. We're going to be doing a re-release of some of those and a re-up of some of those very soon. Grape gas line. Um, and then, uh, you know, the Node Labs library. It's pretty cool. Um, you know, we have like 261 verified clone lines in vitro. Um, we're one of the biggest. Um, you know in vitro clone libraries in the world. And uh, the cool thing about that list is that it's not like, it's a curated list. Like if we have a cut, we have, you know, 10 OGs. If some OG is just like another OG, but this one performs better, we're just like, okay, we don't need that. Um, that, that 200, you know, that 261 strains are like the best of the best in their own category. And that's where we're really trying to be like germplasm storage, like a repository to have a representative from every type of terp, from every type of experience, from every type of plant, for every type of grower. Um, it's just super exciting. And I, I nerd out about like looking at that list and we're really excited about what we can do with that list. And we want to be, you know, we want to continue interface with uh, interface with commercial growers and consumers and hobbyists, um, you know, at every level. So really appreciate you guys. And I really appreciate, appreciate you, uh, Travis, for having me on today. So thank you so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure, Chris. Are you actively looking to get the cam on that list as well? It sounds like I'm hoping I'm rooting for you. If that's like one, that's a draft pick for the list. Cause we have multiple, we have multiple cams. One I'm excited about is vapor fuel, which we actually hunted from a Vermont, Vermont greenery, little shout out to them. 
Um, but vapor fuel was something vapor fuel BX. So vapor fuel was part of our, uh, oh, shit. I think it's part of our menthol line. Um, gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on that. Uh, uh, but it was, uh, chem I 95, I believe by, uh, jet fuel gelato menthol. Fuck. I gotta, gotta go back to that, but, um, we're, hunt, we're hunting cool, some uh, of that stuff. We're getting some chems. We're really excited about it. Amazing. It was a pleasure to meet you, Chris. Like, thanks for the time. Thank Everyone you so much. Compound Genetics, check out Daga. Don't buy nothing from me because these guys know a lot more than I do. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thanks so much, everyone who attended today.